Guys, when we saw that we are talking about the same thing, we are talking about the same thing. 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 We are talking about the me Ramdan met Quenta Gantan is Kawazia Rekitet, Sunsa, Kidavertel, Skopira Pirada Kesauber, Kidavertel with Rui, Amitabse, Paula Bachet, Kalipornis University, Berkeley, Shikan, there is a Kalta Corpus Department, she has Professor Rita Pedagogics with Setau Jomare, Masakanian, Beuri Saint Arizona Shromi, Romans at Conchet, Shakitia Kites, not so she let me throw it. Mega Giziaret, am documents. Much of the documents include the fact that the National Minister of the Queer Alliance is a member of the Hindu nation. We are not going to be Pirolic she had Italian signed at a sort of that's Michelania, twenty services from Paula Aris, probably any activist. Is Jacket of Samus that Tian Slapshi or Chartul, Lesbos or Queer, Feminist or Anti Racist or the Colony, Romisat in Arda Guanti or Copatur, Memorjon Radicals in Arda Garsabu Mudra of Bepshi, American Shartabus at Bepshi, Saprangachi, Italia Sata in Doechi. Samuzatian <laughs> So the Hanshi is a survey for Charter Shaukanian, Robert Antirasis, Robert Kitter Antirasis to the colony or Chukupepshi, Machoris, Amolan Abidan, Dictactic is Molan Abidan, so the Hanshi is Asset Shakuris, Hardajaris, and Mudrova's Charter of his Gamo, Iknaka Samar Lapolita, Shank of Devonashim of Heboda, the period of the Karkol period, the Sikh Shitsi, or the Shankom, Saprangachi, as it was Awida, or the Nizgamo, the Solid Ikta, it's called Mosian Slepshi, or Mosian Slepshu. Activist Uri Zola, Kagzaleba, that's already Kumurta, Hormatia, is it in the Shnolani collective, so Gortalis, Lesbos, the collective, Magalta, Rasis, Misera, Pashis, Missina, Rondek, Romans, Tower, Tower, that's active, as it got his hours. Dress Paula, the less I tell us, almost Mursaneba, Kneba, is Mitzilad, Mortens, Pokusirebas, Dress, Asabu, the Michel, Sajiros, got Alliance, Romanis, the Italian Sabiculis Mops, Kairtian, and Bubzolas, for the Swak, they were two pep shoris, Swaraswa, Academy of Sulsepshi, that train of social developers, Tavina Hot Rasnishnaus, Zola, Kanman Tawisuplebelli, perspective, Rasnishnaus, Emancipat, Emancipat, or Zola, the Missing Tawari, Missy Jim, Miss. So quite Mohsane Bashiaris compromise of his garish, as Nishna Timas, which when you put Zola on Tavat Agmot, compromise of his garish, Tatma of his garish, we heard him Saris as a Agnishna from Talia Tulia, politics are Moeba, Magram Chun Mutumi to the West Rapot, Hanwa Hortello, Chuni Politica, compromise of his garish. Mehmet Sahar Shekat and Taus, when Tavat were in a house, Paulus Mohsanebas, Mogit Electrum, Paula Shemkom, Discussive Shak to the Chirton, that's what Kit Hobby. That's why I put the other kid of Pro Macha with it for the Sposak. She did him at Lobak in the world of Paulus out more serious. Thank you. Okay, before I begin, I really want to thank Lika, Maya, Tam Tam, Tornika, who did the translation, and also you who are doing the translation now for everything that you've done for us. It has been wonderful, and I think both of us. All of us appreciate it very much. Thank you also for everyone who has come. Um, I'd like to begin by invoking some recent incidents of different kinds of forced silencing of power as political acts. So last summer, I was invited to participate in a workshop on decoloniality, which is a topic on which I've worked throughout my life, pretty much. So I was happy to join it. It was in Paris, and overall, 
the workshop was very fruitful, but at a certain point, the participants, we were majority people of color, we were asked to contribute to a collective text to analyze power and to reflect on resistance. So we were given a draft of a text, and this text you know, denounced coloni colonialism and it denounced capitalism. And I noticed that it did not denounce uh, misogyny. So I raised my hand and I thought this will just be an, ex uh, you know, an accepted point and we'll then move on. But then it, it became very contentious. So one woman participant uh, said, you know, well, we don't need to talk about misogyny because it's included in um, colonialism and it doesn't need to be named. And then she added that, well, we don't need to hear about all these identities. And of course, I'm a very out queer person, um, you know, so that, was, that meant we don't want to hear about lesbians, gays, trans, and all that. So um, I, I replied that I had not really brought up the question of identities, and I was not suggesting that we include the laundry list of identities, but um, instead, you know, that we think about misogyny as a something that structures all of life. You know, misogyny along with capitalism and colonialism is an enormous uh, large-scale relation of power with many different facets to it, that it, like queer phobia, sexism, everything, and that it structures uh, life. Well, the, then, again, she repeated that it wasn't necessary, and then a man intervened, straight man, to say, well, that I was breaking up the unity of the decolonial group, so I should keep quiet. And um, it, 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 for a very long while, no one articulated any, uh, any kind of solidarity with it. And then a young woman, young black woman, stood up and, and started you know, just defending the position. Uh, but she was also argued down. So the, for me, what this signified was that foregrounding one relation of power, coloniality, in this case became the occasion to silence another relation of power, which was misogyny. Now, this incident took place on the 12th of June, 2017, which is the one year anniversary of the um, massacre of 49 queers, nearly all of color, on Latinx Queer Night at the Pulse Nightclub in Orlando, Florida. So in that morning, because it was the anniversary, I had awoken with thoughts of the mass murder and also about its traumatizing effects on queers of color, including myself. And later in that morning, in the same workshop, uh, participants held a ceremony to honor people who had resisted against colonialism. So I raised the question of a very close friend and colleague, the Algerian lesbian poet and filmmaker and essayist, um, Dalila Kadri, who was an activist against colonialism, capitalism, and misogyny at the same time, and she spent her entire life in resistance, and she, but she committed suicide some months earlier, and many of us are very committed to keeping Dalila's life alive through, you know, her memory alive through this. Now, the June 12th workshop, Orlando and Dalila's suicide together, to me, entailed different murderous effects of misogyny, including queerphobia, different kinds of exile of memory. So, to imagine misogyny included in colonialism is to reduce misogyny to feelings or beliefs or to a prejudice or to mentalities, and instead, I think it's more productive to think about misogyny like coloniality and capitalism as structuring life, um, as agentic in subject formation and in conduct, including the suppression of speech, torment, and ultimately deadly elimination. So misogyny, when forced into silence, continues nonetheless to operate in full force. It functions as an unacknowledged excess. Now, in what I'm going to be talking about today, I want to argue that any effective strategy for freedom in our times requires that we diligently refuse to keep quiet about any part of large-scale relations of power. And that includes misogyny, but it also includes coloniality and capitalism. So we need to directly address all the small and, and specifically localized relations of power be they specific forms of racism, Islamophobia, anti-migrant,
migrant, questions of micro class or caste or other. So it, we, our job is very complex, but it's also very interesting. Uh, be, but because when we do not address some relation of power, it gets inadvertently reproduced anyway, and it just remains there uncritiqued. So my argument is that we need to be very diligent with that. And so as difficult as it may be in the spaces in which I work, which are primarily the United States where I live, uh, France also where I spend a lot of time, and India, um, I think we need to insist on our academic and activist work on a position of no compromises with any relations of power to whatever degree possible at all times. And I think that if we do not do that as queer people, then it, it, it ends up being quite deadly for us. Our lives depend on it. And I think that it is also futile to, to build freedom objectives, movements, and solidarities that on, on negating any part of power. And that this uh, vigilance is required to curb the tendency of groups and individuals, including ourselves, because nobody is perfect and we are all formed in relations of power, and we all, myself included, can reproduce relations of power, um, that because of our very formation as subjects in power, and because of how power operates everywhere, including through us all as subjects, um, then it is really important for us to, to, be, to keep to this vigilance. Now, of course, we can never really achieve that, but it is, a, it is an ideal that we can never completely achieve. Before I continue, and I'm going to be speaking about how I understand the relations of power that are you know, operative where I am living at this time, and I'm also going to, to try and talk a little bit about the social movements. Before I do that, I would like to respect the uh, theory and practice continued configured by US feminists and queers of color in the generation prior to mine, that is a generation that sacrificed itself so people like myself could uh, you know, live here, could be here. And so what they talked about was situating ourselves when we are giving, talking about anything. So I will situate or locate myself um, because like everyone, I'm not a neutral subject and I was born on Turtle Island, which is the name given by many and not all native people to the territory called the United States, the territory that white settlers call the United States. There are other names too, many native communities in what is now called the United States um, call the land simply mother or grandmother. And people in Puerto Rico, what is called Puerto Rico, which means rich port, guess who named that? Um, it's actually Borinquena. So I was born in New York, which is the land of the Lenape and of the Iroquois. It's a territory that has seen six centuries of genocide, rape, theft, privatization of communal land, slavery, racism, the exploitation of workers, and all sorts of recognized and unrecognized crimes against women and queers that are prolonged in many ways today. So I was born as a non-Lenape, non-Iroquois subject, and my genealogy comes through immigration. My four grandparents come from four different places. One is uh, from Mestizaje, out of the indigenous Wayu people in what is now called Venezuela. Another is from Turkey, another from Italy, and another from Northwest Africa. So I was very fortunate to be raised by my uh, Venezuelan grandmother and, uh, until five and a half, and she remained in my life until I was 11. Um, the more recent generations of my family are even more mixed. They include nephews and, and a niece who are Seneca, Iroquois, Turtle Clan, enrolled and living on a, an indigenous reservation in upstate New York right now, um, as well as many others, and I won't go into all of it. But I mention that because I'm in constant dialogue with them and that info does, in fact, inform a lot of how I see things. Um, so I want to clarify that I don't actually uh, you know, claim to represent any particular group or any particular nation, and that's for two reasons. First of all, I never ran for any office, and no group ever elected me to represent them. And then secondly, I'm too mixed, uh, actually, you know, racially, culturally, geographically, to have any one mono identification, so I don't do that. Um, and, and instead, 
I just try and respect all the parts of my uh, heritage. So from my early, earliest days, I've been queer. My first political activism was in junior high school against racism and then in high school against uh, sexism. After graduation from high school, I moved to Philadelphia where I became a co-founder of the group Dyke Tactics, about which I will speak in a little while. And Dyke Tactics worked in solidarity with many of the liberation movements of the day. Um, Dean Spade just now spoke about the 70s and about the liberation movements of the 70s. And I was involved in, um, Dyke Tactics is one of those, those very radical uh, groups that, that uh, Dean was just now speaking of. We were in solidarity with uh, black liberation, Native American liberation, and uh, with the Puerto Rican liberation movement. I was arrested on false charges, put in prison, uh, to make a long story short, I then went into exile, and I first went to Rome where I lived in uh, a feminist squad afterwards, and I was also involved in a lesbian group, anarchist group, called Rifutare, which means to refuse. Because of political repression in Italy, I moved in 1979 to Paris where I was involved in feminist, lesbian, pro-immigration, and anti-racism movements. And later I moved to uh, India where I was involved in queer movement also in India in two groups. One was a lesbian group called the Delhi Group and the other was um, a, a, a lesbian, trans, and queer group called um, the Red Rose Group. And um, also I was involved in the movement against the Hindu nationalist right wing. So today I work in, back, I'm back in Paris a lot and work in um, sort of, you know, organizing around a huge LGBT, uh, queer, and trans of color group network. So now I would like to just say a few words about the conditions under which we are working today in the US and in France. So uh, as you know, across many countries of the global north and the global south, we experience a kind of a flagrant rightward uh, shift. In, in, but in the US especially, this newly elected government is trying to, to restructure the economy and all the apparatuses of the state. Every single person who's been selected to represent some unit of the state is actually trying to take it apart. In other words, to destroy it. And education is one area that we're seeing very clearly with Betsy DeVos, who um, is into privatization against, the pu against public uh, education. So they're also working to reconfigure the public discursive space, or what Arjun Apadurai calls mediascapes and ideoscapes, to make right-wing presuppositions, categories, logics, values, and conclusions as normative as possible. So we are living in an age of what Ashi Membe calls necropolitics, or the selective politics, not only of engineering life in the way that Foucault talks about with biopolitics, but also of engineering death, uh, and of what Jin Haritawarna et al reflecting on what this means actually for queer people have called queer necro politics uh, defined as everyday death worlds including imperial war and its tactics and the normalized violence of racism and misogyny. So one queer necro political tactic is murderous inclusion. Murderous inclusion takes forms ranging from the kind of silencing that I just talked about in the decolonial uh, workshop or forced assimilation, or individual murders, such as of the four black lesbians murdered just this week in the United States, there were four black lesbians murdered just in the last five days or six days, and also, or the mass murder that we uh, had to deal with, with in, in the Pulse in Orlando. In the US, with the election of the white supremacist Trump, whom many of us call simply 45 because he's the 45th president and we can't stand to say his name. So I will be saying only 45 from now on. Um, there, the whole selective homicidal character of the politics of the state and many of its apparatuses is, has come out of the closet. And um, we are seeing it that what used to be done in a hushed way is now done very openly and they're actually declaring, you know, 
and it is passing more and more for common sense in the sense of, of Antonio Gramsci. It's passing for, this is just the way things are. So many long-standing brutalities are now really perceptible. They, they used to be more closeted. And that includes the continued theft, exploitation, and toxification of nation, native lands as petrol companies are given free reign, the increasing militarization of the police who receive millions per year now in military equipment, the rise of colonial and racist murders by the police, the extension of poverty to now 43 million people out of the US population of 325.36 million, the expansion of the colonial and racist prison industrial complex and the increasing slavification of inmates. They've become more like slaves than like inmates because they are, they are work, they work now for private companies and are hardly paid anything. So we have also the racist and classist deprivation of health care. We have the inhumane separation of families due to deportation, um, to immigration policies. We have, um, you know, we have language like the shithole countries that you must have seen in the last few days. Um, we have enthusiasm for more walls, especially with Mexico. The systematic dismantling of education through privatization and um, this blatant disregard for life as we see in Puerto Rico, which is supposed to be part of the United States where there's no relief to any of the, uh, you know, the, what, what went on over there. And the social sectors most affected by these issues, of course, are the most vulnerable sectors, but within them there are queers. And, and queers are disproportionately harmed in all of them. And many uh, US domestic policies, of course, have, have very deadly consequences for spaces and subjects outside of the US. They bear on global labor, international monetary exchange, and the toxification of the entire planet, and those, that's just some examples. So at the same time, I think we need to really recognize that there is a great deal of uh, continuity between the earlier politics and the present politics. It's not like suddenly we have a big shift to the right. We have a big shift to declaring that it's okay to do all this. But this has been going on for a very long time and it is not new. So it, there's also been no shift at all in US foreign policy. In fact, Obama in many ways was worse. And let's see what we will have. We don't know what, what 45 will bring us. Um, there's been a total disregard for life, uh, you know, in Iraq, Afghanistan, elsewhere across the globe, and including in the U.S. support bolstering up of is the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Now, in most of Western Europe today, domestic and foreign policy is also continues to be organized around Islamophobia and around racism. In France, racist Negro politics are unfolding, especially in the practices of selective, racialized policing, imprisonment, expulsion, exclusion from labor sectors or from education, and this remains massively unchallenged except by people of color and some white allies, um, anti-immigration policies and racism against French people of color are generally legitimized by blaming Arab and black men for sexism and queer phobia. It's as though white men are not queer you know, are not queer phobic or sexist. So that this also includes the trope that Anne McClintock uh, refers to as the porno tropics or the construction of the global south as a site where sexual desires that are forbidden in the global north can be totally played out. Um, the racist insistence that, that Arab and black men are more queer phobic than white men is paradoxical considering that some Arabs and blacks are also queer and also that in uh, January 2013 the anti-queer group comprised of white French people called um, the, the Demonstration for Everyone, La Banif Pour Tous. It mobilized 1.4 million people in France, nearly all of them white, across the country, including 100,000 people in Paris, to protest against uh, queers through the issue of gay marriage, which I 
disagree with the, I have, I share Dean Spade's analysis of what gay marriage is, it's not helpful to us and it's harmful, but still it became the occasion for the right wing to protest, uh, you know, just to bring out all of this pure phobia against us. So, um, I want to point out that there has never been, in the history of France, a massive Arab and black demonstration against queers, ever. So the idea that Arabs and blacks are more queer phobic than French has no empirical basis and is pure racism. Now, well, well some, some may imagine that we live in a period of state feminism and homo nationalism. Just a few days ago in France, the Minister for Housing, Christine Boudin, was exonerating for calling homosexuality an abomination. She, she publicly gave an interview where she said homosexuality is an abomination. And today, um, you know, there, there's an argument about free speech in France that permits uh, hate, hate speech against queers. It's okay to have hate speech against queers, but you cannot critique state racism. So about two weeks ago, a friend of ours who's a feminist uh, activist, black filmmaker, and essayist and journalist, uh, Rokaya Gao, she was excluded from a government committee for critiquing um, French, the French state's racism and Islamophobia. And also last year, we tried to have a conference on uh, intersectionality, and it was also going to be part of continuing education for secondary te school teachers. And the government outlawed the, uh, the it would not give the secondary school teachers time off as they usually do every year for every other conference to go to this one on intersectionality. So all, all of these things I'm just pointing to as examples to make the point that you know it, it really is based on racism and on Islamophobia at this time. So the foreign policy, um, you know that globally in the world 28,300 people are forced into exile because of war, and relatively few of them end up anywhere in Western Europe. But instead, they're found from Turkey to Uganda, and France's borders are practically sealed. So while France continues political, economic, and cultural control over its neo-colonial territories, um, it, 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 it is also trying to have a politics of murderous inclusion. And I think the concept of murderous inclusion is very salient for us as queers. Um, the, the colonial and racist logic of this murderous inclusion was put on display in by presidents of France. The first one, you know, Nicolas Sarkozy, gave a speech in 2007 in Dakar, in Senegal, and um, in which he, he invoked Africa as a place without a history. So that's a very alien sort of, you know, racist, imperialist way of thinking about Africa. And a few months ago, France's current prime minister, uh, president, sorry, he gave a speech in Burkina Faso where he uh, reproduced again the, this colonial idea that Africa is overpopulated. So, and of course, African intellectuals, they massively, massively critique that. Um, now I'd like to talk about queer movements. What does all this mean for queer movements? I'm talking about, you know, like the, these are the relations of power that are there that we need to also grapple with. And in the middle of this, uh, for queers, and especially queers of color, but all queers, uh, is what we so what should we do about our social movements? Well, let's think about the U.S. first of all. And what we're seeing is that there's a continuum and it's polarized on two sides in many different movements, and not only queer movements. So there's, we're not really, our movements are not as, you know, they're not out 
one of the things we did was we used the trial to uh, talk about queer people because we got a lot of press, you know, everyone wanted to come and see the queer films. So we were all over the television, all over everything. So we would say things, they would start on the stand when they asked, so are you a lesbian? You know, that is actually the kind of question they had. But yes, just like 20% of the population of Philadelphia. And it would come on the, in the newspaper, 20% of the so we used it like that. You know, to, every night we thought, well, what will we say tomorrow? You know? So that's what we did. But we lost, of course. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we need to go back to the kind of analysis and everything that we had at that time. Uh, I, but I do think we can learn from, from, from some successes and from some mistakes. But I do think that today we're in a very different period and we need to work against the relations of power that are here today in which we are working. We can't just apply something that, we, you know, that was configured in a different period of relations of power. So it's very important to first diagnose the relations of power and then figure out what to do. And unfortunately, uh, many of the national normative assimilationist queer goals today actually reinforce oppression and exploitation, dispossession and, repro uh, and repression of some sectors of society, including queers. So for example, you know, in the United States, marriage, uh, there are lots of rights that are uh, dependent on marriage. You know, so not just things like inheritance, which of course gets us into private property and all that other stuff, but um, health care. Health care can be dependent on uh, marriage. It's, that's for straight people. Now for queer people, you know, to say, well, we want, we want uh, gay marriage is a way of saying that, first of all, that we are entering into this, you know, homonormative kind of uh, mode, but also it's giving up our struggle to have universal health care by birth for every person. That is what we need to be fighting for. So some of our queer demands are demands that are for everybody. And that if they're extended to us, they're extended to everybody, you see. So that's a problem. Um, feminists, of course, have critiqued marriage as a, as a relation of property. And it's almost like, well, we forgot all about that. Now we just want gay marriage. So, you know, we have a lot of problems with that. And um, the another, and at the same time, we still are seeing some persistent revolutionary queer desires for total liberation. And um, I can provide an, an, an example of that. Like we, in Europe right now, Western Europe, we have a, a, a group, it's a network, and it's called Decolonizing Sexualities. And it's mainly people of color. And um, we uh, are located in lots of different countries and we come together, we have conferences and we try and configure certain uh, things that we're going to work on together. And if something happens in one country, we all come in in solidarity with that. With that. We are working across borders very effectively at this time. Um, and, in, and we're also doing this in France at a local level where we have had these Every year now we're having a town hall where we start in the morning and we go through till the evening with uh, panels uh, where we have discussion. And so different queer groups that don't usually come together come together for our town hall. And we're organizing one right now for uh, the 16th of March, uh, which, is, which corresponds to Queer Week in France. So I want to just rapidly conclude. And um, the, I, the conclusions are that I want to think about what it takes to construct non-negotiable liberation-oriented perspectives and goals and strategies and tactics and alliances, not everywhere in the world, but where I'm working, because I don't know the conditions. As I said, I think it's important to first know what the relations of power are wherever you're working. Um, but for us, you know, um, in both sites, we, we think that life, that we can benefit from reimagining queer community beyond the immediate local groups, beyond our immediate nations and regions, and by thinking more very, very locally, as well as more planetarily. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, um, to think 
very locally is to think, well, what are the most marginalized groups? Because within every group there are queers. So what are the most marginalized groups at, at local level, wherever we are? It could be a city or, any, or, or a country. Um, and what, you know, what, what does it, what are some of the major problems there? And, wh and why, if they are not in the room, why is that? and what needs to be done to do that. And we, we came to that really out of our own exclusion. We were excluded, people of color were excluded for a very long time in, in things. So now we're asking ourselves, who are we excluding, you see? So um, we should also ask, like, um, what would it take then to seriously address all these problems? And whatever issues we actually work on, you know, we can work on one issue, but still have in mind the connection of all the issues. Like, if we work on queer homelessness, which is a big problem in the US, for example, where homelessness in general is a big problem, um, then what, how what does this connect to other issues that, that we are working on? How can we have a broad analysis? You know, why, why do we have homelessness? What's, what's specific about queer homelessness? And what is it connected to, et cetera? So, then we, we have some groups doing this, and an example is the anti-carceral movement that works for the abolition of prison, of the prison industrial complex. So we, this is queer anti-carcerality is what we're, we, how we refer to it. And it connects racial, class, and sexual politics of the prisons with a critique of how racism operates in dominant white queer claims for safety. Dean talked a little bit about this about how, you know, now that we have gayberhoods, neighborhoods that are gay, um, that are mainly white and gentrified, then queer, you know, white queers have wanted protection because they see the police as protecting them, whereas people of color generally do not see the police as protectors, but rather as aggressors. And um, so many gay groups are demanding more policing to make them safe, but uh, safe for whom? They're not safe for any person of color. That's for sure. Because of racial profiling, if a person of color is in a dom predominantly white neighborhood in the United States, they are, a com they can come, they'll be harassed by the police. And so this anti-carceral queer movement is trying to connect anti-prison work um, with, you know, a critique of racism within the queer community. And and also, it is also trying to connect it with issues of so-called security, which is also connected to U.S. foreign policy in places, you know, around the world, and it's Islamophobic uh, foreign policy in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. So all this idea of safety, whose safety are we talking about? So um, the other thing is that to think a very planetarily will help us to better a analyze what's going on. See, if we don't connect prison in the US with Afghanistan and Iraq, we're making a mistake. We need to connect all of these things together. Um, and so, the, this is one, but one problem with the anti-carceral movement is this. While we're abolishing prisons and thinking about neighborhoods, all of this land actually is colonized land. The US is a settler colony. So we need to also think about that, and it's not yet being thought about, but that's, that needs to also configure into it. That, you know, this, uh, for example, I live in San Francisco. I live in Berkeley, and it's near San Francisco, and that whole territory is, belongs to the Olone people, which are native people. From, and they don't have any land of their own. They do not, they are not recognized. They don't even have a reservation. And reservations in the US are terrible pockets of poverty. But they don't even have that. So that's a problem to be thinking about the anti-carceral without thinking about that. So, and then a second advantage of thinking both very locally and very planetarily to configure local goals, strategies, and tactics is the way that it can enable alliances. From the time that we are starting to think about anti-carcerality and the conditions of queer people, you know, uh, and queer homelessness, etc., then we are, we are also making alliances with other groups as we're going along, and we're in dialogue with them about queer issues. So to be in dialogue about queer issues is also to bring them into some sense 
in some sense to, you know, to democratize our analysis in a way that that helps them to understand where we're coming from and for and, and we work more broadly that way. So those kinds of solidarities are really important and um, and I and I so again I just want to reiterate for me the question is we should never leave any relation of power uncritiqued and that we need to think very locally and very broadly and um, when we are configuring any particular issue we can work on a very small issue and still think broadly about it so that's all thank you and I look forward to the discussion thanks You know, all, I spent my entire life a queer. I was never straight. I did not go through any big straight anything. Um, and I'm very motivated for us. And because, you know, I, I had the opportunity to basically to live a queer life. You know, I've lived a queer life up till now. And I also am very optimistic. Um, I, I have seen that we've been able to create a lot of things, that we've created things all over the world, and we are continuing to create, and in fact this meeting is one of, one of the beautiful creations that I'm, my introduction to your country is through the, your beautiful creation. And uh, so I feel very motivated to continue, and I, and, you know, I don't, uh, we have had a lot of setbacks, but they don't set me back because I believe that we will end up, you know, we will end with, at some point, we, we have, we will end up f being able to be free. And for me, the whole thing is how do we get free? So I've been asking myself that question since I was around 10 years old, you know. Um, when you, when you make the, when you ask the question about how, doesn't it seem like it's too much if we, uh, you know, if we have to deal with all these relations of power at once. Well, actually, they're all interconnected. And so it, it is it, to do a thorough job of figuring out what are the relations of power in which we are living helps us to work on even just one issue. If you want to, I'm not saying that people, can you hear? Oh, so I'm not saying that we need to, uh, you know, work on 50 issues at once. It's impossible to do that. We can work on one issue, keeping in mind all the relations of power. Now, because when we do not keep them in mind, we are excluding some queer people. There are queers in every sector of society. And that's one motivation. The other is that if we are for queer liberation, we are also for total liberation. I don't believe that queers will be liberated, free, without the entire society being free. And from our positionality as queer people, we work, you know, for, the, for our freedom, but also for the freedom of, of all people, I hope. Um, I, th I think that it actually it's very tiresome not to think about all the relations of power, because we then reproduce them, which then is counterproductive, which then gets us nowhere. So if we want to get somewhere with things, then we do need to take all of them into consideration. But I, that does not mean we work on everything at once. We can be in solidarity with many struggles. For example, if someone is working uh, on, against police brutality, and you are working again uh, to, uh, on, uh, say, gay homelessness or something like that, queer homelessness, trans homelessness, then if, they, if the police brutality people need you to sign a petition, you just sign it because you've already thought about that issue, you see? So we can work on each other's issues without putting major energy, you know, that doesn't mean you have to be split between 50 issues because that's not possible. You will burn out in five seconds, you know. Uh, so I can symp I'm sympathetic to that, you know, to that worry. But every issue that we work on is multifaceted and we, they all take place within a context of relations of power, and it's a good idea for us to understand the relations of power before trying to configure a strategy, is what I'm saying. So, um, and then the question of police brutality and what to do. Um, you know, this is, we were, uh, I mean, I think that, I don't know this, the context here well enough to adequately answer your question, but I might be able to 
um, I think it's really great that, if the, that, that there's organizing going on against police brutality, the redress against it. There are many other things to do while, we're, while redressing against police brutality, such as trying to organize among uh, queer people to, for alternatives to the police, trying to configure what are some alternatives to that. But um, I myself, we, you know, I'm one of what we, we're called the Dyke Tactic Six, meaning that we are the, we took the police to court for police brutality first in the United States. Um, and we did that because we were just really outraged, you know, that we should be beaten up for, in a demonstration for queer rights. So, but after that, we did not work so much on police brutality, we connected it when we worked on it, we connected it to um, the brutality that, of the police against many other sectors, not just queer people. We worked, you know, with, there was, there was police brutality against straight black men in the United States. So we, we connected it to, to other issues. And in connecting it, we brought them to, into our solidarity. And we were in solidarity with other sectors as well, straight people, everyone. So, you know, having like a united front against police brutality. Okay, so we have, there's a difference between a strategy and a tactic, right? So a strategy is a longer term and thing which is, can be from a more revolutionary vision of things. The tactic is something that is before, you know, like it's the, it's the praxis of, that is happening before it, right? So the difference between a longer term strategy and its and goals and a tactic. Now, some of the tactics I really, you know, I sympathize with what you're saying because we, there are right now everywhere, you know, in queer queer conditions uh, are pretty bad in most places. Not everywhere because I would say that among indigenous communities it's not like that. But the whole communities are uh, having a lot of problems. But the but you know to want to get rid of or to remedy some of the violence, uh, the, this worry about that, you know, what you just now said about that, um, that would come under, under the rubric of a tactic. And the way maybe to configure it is how to think about that tactic in a longer term perspective. What, how does, how, what action on a particular issue actually leads to a more, uh, is part of a more revolutionary kind of a perspective about things. How, because there are many different ways to do tactics. Now, one of the things that we, that, that we did, and I don't think we were the epitome of the revolution at all, you know, we are not a big model to be followed or anything like that, but we were part of a movement that was broad and many, there were many other groups also doing that. One thing was that we had a way, a way of life. Uh, we refused uh, many things. We refused sexism we refu to such a degree that we had a, an autonomous house. And we also refused, like for example, the misogyny of a body has to look a certain way. So we closed up our house and we would not even let the gas man come in to read the meter. We told them, you want to have someone read our gas meter, you please send a woman. Because we are walking around nude in our house in the summer, you know. Um, it, what we did was we actually, we created, the whole movement actually created an alternative food uh, distribution place. So we had cooperatives and they were in many different cities. I worked in one in, uh, for a while. And we created our own little institutions. We had bookstores, we had, but this is of course within, without any naivety, we're still within a big capitalist you know, context, unfortunately. But what we did was experiment with, uh, what are some of our basic needs? Housing, so let's live together. What we need, food, so let's have cooperatives. You know, this, we need clothes, so let's share clothing. You know, we looked at basic things like that, and that was part of a long, an experiment with a longer-term vision. Now, of course, unless you overthrow the United States government, we cannot have a revolution. But what we did was we wrote about how we would like to do that, which of course is why some of us ended up in prison. 
Um, but we, you know, we did write about, uh, and we did plant the seed for that the whole time, that we would like to overthrow the U.S. government by any means necessary. Um, th those are words, and what we did was concretely what I just told you. But I think also that it's important not to work only for the long term and that you are right to work, you know, against immediate, immediate violence. And that it can be done keeping in mind a longer term thing. By no compromises, I mean no compromises with our analysis of power. That's what I mean. That we, I don't mean no compromises about everything, but our no compromise, the no compromises is that we should always analyze to the degree possible every relation of power, even if it is not directly oppressing us. But, you know, it, 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 we need to analyze all the relations of power. And where I'm located, that means uh, coloniality, colonialism and coloniality, capitalism and uh, misogyny as the large, what I've called uh, co-productions of power. And then there's what I've called co-formations of power which are the localized, but that's a whole other thing. We can discuss that some other time. What I meant though is about no compromises is about the way that we analyze power and the way we analyze power then affects uh, what we do about it and what we do about any particular issue because we have a broader view of that issue and of the dynamics and of the power relations. Now, you were saying about separatism, I would like to make a difference, you know, just differentiate between separatism and autonomy. Separatism is I'm going over in my own little corner and I do not care what happens to anyone else. Separatism is, is something, but autonomy is, I am living, you know, in an autonomous space. To me, the experience of living in an autonomous lesbian collective many years ago has sustained me for many years. And I am still in contact with all of the women with whom I lived. We have a Facebook group, it's private and we don't always agree on things, which is very funny, you know, to see how people change and all that, but we are still very much in solidarity. And uh, it is a very, it was a very intense experience, and it is one of the things I was just now asked what sustains. It is one of the many things that sustains me, but um, then you were talking about someone, you know, about this situation which we do face also, um, I have faced the same situation you're talking about where you're in solidarity with some struggle and you're out as a queer person, but then you get attacked, you know, for, um, you know, because there's queer phobia. The thing, first thing that I would suggest is just to analyze, like, why is there queer phobia? What's going, what exactly is going on? Um, and the second thing is how have societies or parts of sectors of societies been blocked so that there's not a discussion possible of queer issues. So I'm thinking, for example, of work that the Palestinian uh, queer group of Quotes has done. And I think we can all, I mean, I know I've learned a lot from what the Palestinian queers have done. And one of the, what they've done is, their, their analysis is, our society has been blocked by the occupation of our land by Israeli occupation, and we have not been able to have any real discussion about, about sexuality because we haven't had any discussion about anything, really, about social issues. We are just trying to escape from you know, bombardments and trying to survive and things like that. So the society is blocked and unable to have a discussion, not because of the, the fault of individuals in the society or the society's fault, but rather because of the political situation and the relations of power that are operative in that situation. However, when our uh, other our queer colleagues in Palestinian colleagues, they have been able to, they're a part of the BDS movement, the boycott, um, divestment and sanctions movement, and they have had discussions with uh, straight Palestinians who prior to having discussions with them never thought about queer issues where if they thought about them, thought, mm, we don't want them around, you know, who are they? Um, and now, 
the, now the, they've, they have had so many discussions in the context of the movement having to support, of course, first a bunch of queer phobia like you are discussing. Um, but then, but now some of the people with whom they've had a long-term discussion have become the most fervent fighters for queer liberation, straight people. And it's through the discussion and working with them, and I know some of them, and it's just phenomenal to see them because we'll be at a conference and someone will do, say something or do something and he'll stand up and have a fit, you know, uh, on our behalf of queers, of all queers. So I think, you know, they, one thing about people who are in a struggle but they've not thought about queer issues and they end up oppressing us, because that does happen, is if we can stick with it and continue the discussion, it, there are some who will be moved, you know, and who will become allies. And when we have a straight ally who's very committed, that's a very nice thing. We do have a, this, a similar kind of dichotomy between people who are politically active, queers who are politically active in queer struggles, and people going and hanging out in all the bars and things, and doing exactly what you said, you know, they go to the bar at, one, uh, at night and during the day they have to deal with all this other queer phobia. Well, one of the things that we have done is that when we have a struggle going on, we will write a position paper, but one that's accessible, not in our language that we use with each other now, you know, not homonationalism, feminine, and all that. But, uh, you know, we write a position paper and take it to the bar and distribute it and say there's a meeting and here, is, this is where it is, please come to the meeting. And some will come uh, and some will not come. Some will never come. They will only go to the bar and go home and, you know, that's it, end of story. But some will come if you, if you I mean, I, that's what they did with us. I don't know if they would come here, but it's worth a try is what I would say, is that if you are, if there's a big struggle, if there's a demonstration to write a position paper, you know, from a queer perspective, you know, this is, this is, a, a, we are having a contingent in this particular struggle, you know, and then see if they come. They may come. Um, I, I tend to think it's a good thing to have some spaces because I tend to think that a space is a, is a place where of potentiality. Of course, it can go nowhere and do nothing also. That's always the risk. But it, it also can be, if we know how to use it properly, it can do something else. Um, we, we have in Paris some, some big controversies over some of our uh, nightclub space. I was never much for the nightclubs. I mean, I was too political to, to, go, to do anything in the evening except write you know, analyses of power. But, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you know, I don't, do know a lot of people who went to them and also were politically active. I don't know how they managed it. But, um, you know, we have in Paris, for example, a problem with these nightclubs in that one of the things were, was that they were actually racist and they were, there was a lesbian club that kept women of color outside, that did not allow women of color in. And so there was an enormous fight about that. And what happened was a woman of color collective formed around it. So even, even the space itself was kind of horrifying and racist, but it did, it, it then, uh, it was a place where a lot of people gathered so that we could know who was queer at least, you know. So I think that we need, I, it's a very important question that you pose and I think that it's, it, it's, you know, it's a good idea to try and think together about how can we subvert this space, you know, what can we do with it, um, how can we politicize it, how can we bring some people who are in this space. Uh, together. What we're seeing now in France is that some, we, there are several different kinds of right-wing groups, not just one. The one is the National Front and it is a populist group and another is a more intellectual right-wing called La Grèce, which is a uh, paganist, you know, uh, right-wing group. We are seeing that in the populist group in France, there are some white gay men who are now rising to power in the right-wing group. 
So, you know, they have managed to recruit. Uh, it's a home, it's, they're homophobic, but what they, their basis is white supremacy. And because white supremacy is not something that was actually dealt with by the mainstream uh, queer groups in France, it is now reproduced to such an, uh, an exaggerated degree that some right-wing leaders are, are, are gay men, you see? And that is a real problem. Now, what to do about the, about the right-wing that is so queer phobic that there aren't any queers in it. Well, it, with if this is what I mean by no compromises, it is important to know, you know, how they recruit, and if they eventually could they recruit some sectors of queers or not? Because in France they were able to recruit people on the basis of white supremacy, so they recruited gay men on the basis of white, white supremacy who say, oh, they're not really, but we, there also are gay people in Trump's campaign. 45 has some gay people in it, you know? Um, so I, I, you know, how do we fight them? Well, personally, I'm not very interested in directly fighting them, but in preempting them, preempting their recruitment of any sector of queer people by having an analysis of power that preempts their recruitment in the future, you know, because very often they'll start off with such a homophobic, but then afterwards, when, when uh, you know, when queers are a little bit more accepted, certain queers, other queers are not accepted, you know, uh, certain queers are more accepted, then they might try to recruit. But you're asking how to fight them when they're in the, in the phase of, um, a really anti-queer phase, is that what you're asking? Because I actually don't have an answer to that. We, what, uh, I think what we need to do is build queer movements because uh, if we are directly fighting them all the time, in general, they, have, they are larger than we are. So it's a strategically a good idea for us to build our movements. But I, again, I don't know the situation, so I can't really... Um, I can't really have a, I don't have any solutions for a situation where I don't understand the relations of power well enough, you see. So, um, but I do know that, they, that when a, a, a right-wing movement that looks like it will always be so queerphobic that it will never do anything with, you know, never recruit any queer people, and then down the line later on, they can end up recruiting queer people. That's what we've seen. We are now seeing, you know, actually there's a statistics, um, there was a study done and 38% of white gay men in France who are married together, 38% of them voted for the fascist national front. That's a, that's a huge percentage. Voting for the fascist nat national front on the basis of their Islamophobia, on the basis of their white supremacy, on the basis of a vision of France without any people of color. And they, you know, they voted for the National Front. And when they were asked, why did you vote? They said, oh, they're evolving. They will eventually have a better uh, position on, on gay people. I was like, really? <laughs> We did have a lot of dialogue with workers, with workers groups and workers struggles, and we had in our collective uh, work, two working class white women, two working class white women, um, who, you know, who were involved in working class struggles, um, and and I think that one way, the dialogue is not just. I think if queer groups are heterogeneous and they have su queer subjects in them who are members and who are from very different sectors of society, then it, it's easier to, uh, you know, to be involved in the different things because coming from the outside and trying to establish dialogue is, is much more difficult than if folks are inside. For example, in Dyke Tactics, the two um, core members who are you know, who are white, 
and from the working class, although afterwards they studied and one became a judge and the other one became a lawyer, um, who does in fact a lot of pro bono legal work, which is really great, still even today. Um, but, but they come from the working class, so the, so the dialogue there is within their own class. And then the rest of us had a learning curve. We had to learn about what the white working class you know, many of us who know what working class of color realities are, but not the white working class. And so the fact of coming, of having a, a heterogeneous group um, is a point of departure for such dialogue and work together. Because, you know, queers are everywhere. So in that, in, in even with coming out of a, that, uh, Majority, although you know, the, in, for sociologists, any oppressed group is always a minority. Even even numeric, it might not be a numerical uh, minority. It might be a numerical majority, but it's still considered a sociological minority in the sense that it doesn't have power. So it's like about relations of power. But I do see what you mean that you know the the vast majority of people who are living in difficult economic conditions. The best way to deal with that, I would think, would be to talk to queers who are living in those sectors and see what, what you know, what the reality is and what they feel should be done. Because there are definitely queers in there. You know, I mean, it's sort of like I'm thinking about how we, how my my collective didactics was involved in the Puerto Rican independence movement because we had people in our collective who were Puerto Rican who were involved in the movement. Um, we were also involved in black liberation and um, and, and we, we had people in, in our core collective who uh, were involved in the black liberation movement who were lesbians. And we had to then, we had the discussions about what to do and how to be involved and you know, it's not easy to know what is one's place if one is outside of the sector that is having, you know, um, that you're trying to, to be in dialogue with. But the, if you have someone in your collective who is, or in your group who is from there, you have a better chance of understanding, especially if there are several of them, uh, what, uh, what, what to do.